Good afternoon, everyone. Hello, and uh, welcome to this uh, special event on World uh, Population Day 2020. I, I will be your uh, host for the next uh, one hour or so. My uh, name is Roy uh, Wadia, and we are extremely pleased to uh, collaborate on this with the 10th Asia Pacific Conference on Reproductive and uh, Sexual Health and uh, Rights, which is called APCR SHR 10. Due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, this uh, uh, conference has actually evolved into an in-person online uh, uh, conference. And uh, uh, they will have some 14 thematic uh, sessions from now till the end of the uh, uh, year. <clears throat> um, uh, today marks the uh, second such uh, session of uh, what is called APCR SHR 10 virtual. Uh, so now, uh, before we start, I just wanted a few housekeeping rules. Except for our speakers, those who are on Zoom, please keep your uh, microphones on silent and please uh, turn off your uh, cameras. Only the speakers should have these on. For the audience as well who's on Zoom, you can send your questions for our speakers in the uh, chat box and for the audience who's on Facebook, please uh, type your uh, questions in the comment box. We will try to get to your uh, uh, questions at the end of the show, time uh, permitting. Now, uh, to uh, share the theme of this day and the uh, significance, let me turn to our uh, regional director, Bjorn Anderson. Bjorn, over to you. Sorry, Bjorn, uh, you're on mute. Thank you, Roy. Yes. Good day, everyone, and welcome to you know, the regional um, World Population Day. Uh, colleagues and friends, and, and thank you again for joining uh, across the region and uh, hopefully also across the globe uh, today um, as we commemorate uh, World Population Day, the most important day in the UNFPA calendar. This is the very first virtual popul uh, Population Day observance UNFPA has conducted in Asia and the Pacific, reflecting the reality of the, of the present time in this age of COVID-19. Indeed, the impact of COVID-19 on the work of UNFPA, the United Nations Sexual and Reproductive Health Agency, and how we can tackle this crisis in collaboration with a range of partners, including our UN sister agencies, is the theme of, of World Population Day this year. In the early days of the pandemic, the United Nations Secretary General expressed his hope that the crisis would bring the world together, with countries working in partnership to tackle what he called the biggest global challenge since the Second World War supported by the UN family working as one. In the months since we have seen challenges in achieving this vision, with stigma and discrimination, racism and xenophobia manifested in various ways, often divide, dividing societies and countries and hindering an effective response to COVID-19. The pandemic has also presented significant challenges related to maternal health, family planning, and gender-based violence. We have seen huge challenges to ensure the continuity of sexual and reproductive health services in Asia Pacific. We, have also seeing, we are also seeing changes in patterns of health-seeking health behaviors of pregnant women who are now fearful to leave their homes and come into contact with potentially COVID-19 positive persons in health facilities. This change in behavior can result in increase in maternal and increases in maternal mortality. In some countries, we are seeing shock stocked out of contraceptives and central level central level due to problems in manufacturing and, glo and global supplies. And as a result, couples are deciding to utilize less effective methods of family planning, increasing in the changes of unintended pregnancies. 
And across the entire region, we are observing unacceptable increases in gender-based violence as a result of lockdowns and confinement in homes with abusive partners. UNFPA's estimates of, of all these damaging impacts for the next several months warn of further devastation with lasting consequences that could stretch over the next decade. But we have also seen examples where cross-country cooperation complemented by support from the United Nations have resulted in better outcomes. There is no doubt that a multilateral approach to global challenges like the pandemic is the only way to go. A message that is all the more important at this time and in this year, 2020, which marks the 75th anniversary of the United Nations itself. Now, let me turn to, my, to some personal reflections of the ICPD program of action. Um, and the current scenario that we are now experiencing has made me reflect outside the box on this turning point of the world and how effectively we can advance the program of action of the International Conference on Population and Development in Cairo, which was adopted in 1994. I was present there at the ICPD, not long after uh, beginning my career in development and the United Nations, to witness the world coming together in an effort to transform the lives of each and every, every person on this planet. I remember lengthy discussions on population growth as a threat to the planet, Thankfully, the global community came together to embrace a paradigm shift on population and development. After years of dialogue and debate between governments, academia, and the civil society, 179 member states agreed upon the landmark ICPD program of action that for the very first time put individual rights and choices with a special emphasis on sexual and reproductive health and rights at the heart of sustainable development. In doing so, countries moved away from an approach of population targets and numbers to policies and programs grounded in gender equality and human rights to ensure that every person could shape their lives for themselves, including the right to choose if and when to marry, if and when to have children, and how many and with whom. Watching this unfold under the stewardship of UNFPA and its then executive director, Dr. Nafi Sadiq, was a deeply move, moving experience for me. It made me determined to devote my life and career to supporting the vision of ICPD with a focus on rights and choices for all. At the time, I didn't fully appreciate how significant ICPD was and how it would impact views and policies in countries but also how population issues have engaged voices from all di different directions. I've been fortunate enough to have been associated with UNFPA in various capacities over the years. As a junior professional officer in Zimbabwe, as chief of staff of UNFPA, and now as regional director in Asia Pacific, one of the most vibrant, promising and challenging regions anywhere in the world. And before moving on to my next point, which uh, is about how we can move forward, I wish to recognize Gita Sen, who is with us today. And I met Gita for the first time when she was heavily engaged in a dialogue with the Swedish delegation uh, to ICPD. And I think you just had received a award in Sweden, maybe from Volvo or some institution. Um, and since then, our paths have met several times over the years. And I thank you for all the work you have made to protect ICPD program of action over the past 25 years. Now, let me look into the future. And of course, I don't have the crystal ball, but this is our thinking right now with, in UNFPA in the Asia Pacific region. And um, over the past 25 years, uh, the world and the Asia Pacific region have made truly significant progress towards ending maternal mortality, ending unmet need for family planning, and ending gender based violence and harmful practices against women and girls. These are the transformative results UNFPA seeks to achieve 
But of course, there are significant gaps that remain in getting to zero, the unfinished business of ICPD. The situation is further challenged by escalating conservatism, even extremism, around the world, jeopardizing the gains made for women and girls. Added to this, we have the ongoing pandemic, whose impact in just a few months has been so damaging. But at UNFPA and the United Nations as a whole, we genuinely believe that the crisis lead to opportunities. And after all, let us not forget that the UN was born out of the devastation of World War II. In Asia and the Pacific, we are now working to forge a path toward forward out of the ongoing pandemic to support countries in building back better by using the ICPD program of action and the sustainable development goals as our templates for post-COVID-19 recovery. We have identified five working streams going forward in this regard. First is to strengthen our understanding of what's happening in countries, in the political sphere in particular, and to be able to anticipate and, st and strategize responses to key trends and developments, even as they appear on the horizon. Linked to that, better identification of emerging issues that may impact our mandate, and programmatic innovation to find better ways of working and coming up with approaches and solutions that make us truly fit for purpose. A humanitarian think tank recognizing that humanitarian response in this, the world's most disaster prone region, is critical to how well we serve countries and people. And finally, a renewed focus on achieving UNFPA's transformative results or the three zeros. To support these work plans or work streams, we're taking the following steps to accelerate the achievement of the ICPD vision in the region, assessing the ongoing socioeconomic impacts of the pandemic and the implications on how countries can implement ICPD and achieve the SDGs. Ensuring that everything we support, we, we support countries in doing is grounded in UN principles, human rights, gender equality, non-discrimination, and leaving no one behind. Engaging with UN partners, or the more strongly, and the, at the regional and country level, given that we don't work in isolation, and that our mandates are connected, one UN shouldn't be an empty phrase, but a genuine reality. And finally, developing specific policy recommendations for governments to be customized and supported by our country offices to ensure that millions of people truly benefit from our work. So friends and colleagues, as we move forward in partnership and solidarity, we must remain vigilant and uncompromising in our pursuit of human rights and gender equality. We need to hold governments accountable to the commitments to the ICPD program of action the SDGs and other international instruments to build a better post-COVID Asia Pacific. We need to work together for societal change so that the lives of women and girls are valued equally with the lives of men and boys. And we must push back against the growing trends of conservatism that threaten our collective efforts so that we get the societies governments decide in 1994 and later on articulated in the 2030 agenda. So in conclusion, let me pledge that at this critical juncture, UNFPA is all the more determined to, to do all it can to achieve sexual and reproductive health and rights for all. The four amazing speakers we have with us today embody this, this vision. Four people from four very different countries and contexts, each of them a trailblazer through their lives and their work. Thank you for joining us this World Population Day, and thanks for all that you do to support a better world for all. I thank you. Thank you so much, Bjorn, for that uh, speech uh, uh, and you know for uh, sharing your own personal uh, story with us as well. So, friends, just about eight months ago, or even less, uh, before the pandemic, we had the ICPD 25 uh, Nairobi Summit where uh, countries, civil society, the uh, private sector came uh, together uh, 25 years after the ICPD in uh, Cairo 
And they made strong uh, commitments once again to the ICPD uh, program of action. Let's watch a short uh, video now, which uh, spells out what these uh, commitments were. Uh, can we have the uh, video, please? Thank you. In 2019, the world marked the 25th anniversary of the landmark Programme of Action of the International Conference on Population and Development. At the 1994 ICPD in Cairo, 179 governments transformed the way we look at population and development by agreeing that individual rights and choices, including sexual and reproductive health and reproductive rights, must be at the heart of sustainable development. A quarter century later, at the Nairobi summit on ICPD 25, governments and other stakeholders came together once again to affirm their commitments to ICPD, including no woman should die while giving life, access to family planning is a right for all, and gender-based violence must end. 25 years ago, over 230,000 maternal deaths were estimated in Asia Pacific each year. Fast forward to today, and that number has dropped to 79,000. While progress has been impressive, much more must be done. That's why at the Nairobi summit, 26 governments from Asia and the Pacific were joined by civil society representatives and the private sector, resulting in 152 commitments towards a achieving the program of action. So far, 60% of these promises are committed to be fulfilled by 2030. 25 countries committed to making childbearing safe by strengthening midwifery and health systems to provide life-saving emergency obstetric and newborn care. Pakistan, for instance, committed to reducing its maternal mortality ratio from 170 to less than 70 per 100,000 live births by 2030. 26 nations also committed to expanding family planning services so that women have access to safe and voluntary contraception and the information they need to exercise their reproductive rights. Mongolia has committed to increasing the percentage of primary healthcare facilities, providing at least five modern contraceptive methods from 30.4% in 2015 to at least 90% by 2030. Physical and sexual violence against women remains a sobering reality in Asia and the Pacific. 25 of the Nairobi commitments from Asia-Pacific countries address prevention and response to gender-based violence amid the wider context of discrimination against women. Cambodia has pledged to ensure all women and girls have equal access to quality gender-based violence information and services by 2030. Fundamental to all commitments made at the Nairobi summit is the pledge to leave no one behind, regardless of their gender, age or disability. In Thailand, the government has pledged to invest more to keep older people healthy and productive. Whilst Lao PDR has pledged to ensure that comprehensive sexuality education is fully integrated into school curricula nationwide by 2030. Fulfilling the pledge of ICPD Program of Action means taking into consideration population dynamics in relation to sustainable development, including the urgent need to tackle climate change, which affects us all. The Cook Islands has committed to doubling up all efforts for the full and effective implementation of the ICPD Program of Action and the Sustainable Development Goals, including through strengthening resilience to climate change and natural disasters. Since Cairo 1994, countries have been working hard to fulfil the ICPD Programme of Action, but we must collectively work even harder. It is time for us all to fulfil our ICPD commitments, keep our promises and build a better world for all. Thank you for that video. Now we turn to someone who actually 
embodies ICPD in all that she's done over the years from Cairo to Nairobi and, of course, uh, these um, days as well. So we turn to uh, Dr. Gita Sen, who is a world-famous feminist uh, scholar. She is uh, currently with the uh, Public Health Foundation of India and also with Harvard uh, 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 University. She has been, uh, of course, I mean, given so many prizes and uh, certificates and awards uh, uh, through this time. And that, of course, includes the uh, uh, Dr. Fred T. Sai Award at the, um, uh, at the uh, Nairobi Summit. And just a few uh, months ago, she was uh, given the uh, truly uh, prestigious Dan David Prize. Geeta, thank you for uh, uh, being here today. And now over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Roy, for those very kind words. And thank you, Bjorn, for remembering uh, our meeting at uh, Cairo during that very, very lively um, conference. Friends, we're living, as we all know, in deeply unsettling times. The pandemic has turned and continues to turn everything upside down. How we live, how we work, how we interact. Already present tendencies in the way we work, for example, growing informalization of work are being heightened. The digital world is taking over at an accelerated pace with many challenges for privacy, personal safety, and autonomy, and for work itself. And of course, as Bjorn said, the backlash against gender equality and human rights generally, but specifically women's and girls' human rights, is fierce um, across the world and to some extent in our region as well. All of this seems very far removed from the small village in South India where I grew up in my grandmother's house. The blue Nilgiri hills in the background, the green rice paddies waving in the, in the breezes, the fragrance of the tomatoes I would pick Gita, up. Gita, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we can't hear you very clearly. Is it possible to speak a bit louder and closer to your uh, microphone? Thank you. How's this? No, it's still very soft, Gita. There is some technical difficulty at your end. Um, how's this? Is this, this is much better? better. Thank you. Please, right. if you wouldn't mind going back a few uh, sentences. Thank you so much. Um, do you want me to go back right to the beginning? Sure. I think that would be the best. Sorry about this. But thank you. <laughs> okay. So you'll have to give me a minute more. I'm sorry. Um, so I, was, I began by saying that we're living in deeply unsettling times. The pandemic has turned and continues to turn everything upside down. How we live, how we work, how we interact. Already present tendencies in the way we work, for example, the growing informalization of work are being heightened. The digital world seems to be taking over at an accelerated pace with many challenges for privacy, for personal safety and autonomy, and for work itself, the nature of work itself. And as Bjorn said, the backlash against gender equality and human rights, everyone's human rights, but specifically the human rights of women and girls, is strong in all, of, all across the world and including in parts of our region. All of this seems very far removed from the small village in South India where I grew up in my grandmother's home. 
the blue Nilgiri hills in the background, the green rice paddies waving in the breeze, the fragrance of fresh tomatoes, which I would pick up in my little hands uh, from the field in the morning. But I also remember other things. I remember how my grandmother, who was a Brahmin widow, I have memories of her standing hidden behind the half-closed door when visitors came to whom she would have to speak about, um, land, about land issues or other things. As a widow, she was viewed as an ill omen. And when she left the home, she would have to leave by the back door so that she wouldn't walk across through the front, um, front uh, street. Um, I remember the lines of worry on her face as she struggled to raise her children, selling her jewelry and the little land she had piece by piece so that she could feed them, so that they could survive and be educated. And all of this because as a Brahmin, she was not allowed to work outside the home for an income. So she was hit from both sides by the caste and the gender system. Has this world of gender and caste inequality really changed for today's girls and women? Of course, there have been many changes, especially in this Asia Pacific region. Girls are more educated. Women work more outside the home for an income. We have more space in public spaces. We're more present in government as well as in legislatures at different levels. But have deep-rooted inequalities really changed? This year's State of World Population report points to disturbing ways in which it hasn't for too many. The report is called Against My Will, Defying the Practices that Harm Women and Girls and Undermine Equality. It focuses on three particular practices, female genital mutilation, child marriage, and Sex, elect sex selection, or as a result of daughter aversion, the aversion to daughters. These practices, as we know, are very present and sadly too present in different parts of our region. Let me turn quickly to what the continuing existence of these inequalities means in the context of the pandemic. COVID-19 has taught us many things, and I want to both identify those things and also say what we need to do. The first is the weakness of health systems, which cannot be changed overnight. Health systems where, as we know, women workers tend to be at the bottom of the health worker hierarchy. What needs to be done? Investment in health. You cannot change health systems overnight in the middle of an epidemic. If you want to be well prepared to handle an epidemic, you need to invest in health systems continuously over a period of time. Investments in health, in education for girls and women, and ensuring that in COVID-19 healthcare packages, we don't allow the exclusion of key requirements for girls and women, including access to safe abortion, including access to and availability of contraception, and comprehensive sexuality education for young people. These are and must be part of essential packages of care. Secondly, 
COVID has taught us about the fragility of economic systems where informal workers, as I said, increasingly predominate. And we only need to look at the case of Singapore, which, was do which is, as we know, one of the highest per capita income countries in the world, and which was doing extremely well in the early phase of the pandemic, but which then suddenly started spiking because the migrant workers who lived in crowded buildings in, on the outskirts of Singapore actually had become the uh, hub for uh, the new spiking that was emerging because they didn't have adequate space during a lockdown and the services that they were getting were clearly inadequate. Women, lower castes, minority ethnicities and religions, migrant workers across national and within national boundaries, these are all the people who are most affected by the weakness and fragility of our economic systems. What needs to be done? We need to move towards universal basic income for everyone, including the migrant workers on whom we depend, but are unwilling to recognize and, and, and give citizenship rights. We need to invest in housing, water, and sanitation. We need progressive tax systems. We have lots and lots of millionaires and billionaires in this region, and they need to pay their fair share, including wealth taxes, in order to be able to fund the public services that are needed. We need adequate transportation, public transportation, so that we don't keep increasing the pandemic problems. Roy, am I running out of time? And I'll You're fine. Go ahead, Gita. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. So um, I'll just take a couple more minutes. Third point inequalities that are deeply structural and in existence don't just melt away in a pandemic. And one of the things that we learned during this virus pandemic was a different kind of pandemic in violence against women and girls. Women and girls locked up with their abusers in the home during lockdowns. What do we need to do? This, this year's State of World Population Report has a number of good cases and examples of actions that can be taken by governments and by civil society. And the World Health Organization now has excellent guidance on what policymakers and, our, and implementers can do about violence against, to reduce violence against girls and women. Fourth thing that we've learned is the complete unreliability and very high cost of private health care. We cannot be dependent on the private sector in health care or in education for that matter if we really want to move to universal health coverage post the pandemic. Investment in public provision of health care services effective regulation of the private sector, and ensuring that the women health workers who predominate at the bottom are treated properly as workers and not as volunteers or peace rate workers who can be paid poorly and left to their own devices without protective equipment without adic the adequate wherewithal in order to do the job that we all depend on them to be able to do. Five, the rapid increase in surveillance and division rather than building community solidarity. Those who have done the latter, building and depending on the expansion of community solidarity, have done much better during the pandemic. 
I can think of the state of Kerala in India, which, among other things, has used the Kudumba Shri Women's Program in order, in fact, to be able to tackle the pandemic. Thailand is another example of this kind of solidarity. And even Dharavi, the biggest slum in Asia, in Mumbai, has done much, much better than people had predicted and were afraid of. Sixth, the backlash against gender equality and the creation of stigma, blame, and squeeze on resources also doesn't go away during a pandemic. And we've seen too little active leadership to remove stigma and to deal with this backlash. And sadly, some leaders have gone in the opposite direction. And we really need to tackle this. Finally, as we know, climate change is upon us. We need sustainable agriculture, water, and energy that supports livelihoods. And all our work in gender and development tells us that the work of women, that women are absolutely key in this move that we need towards a more balanced economy and more sustainable and caring societies. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much for that, Geeta. That was extremely inspiring and very thought-provoking. Um, we were actually going to go to our guest from the Philippines, Dr. Junice Melgar, next, but she has been unfortunately knocked off because there's a huge thunderstorm where she is in the uh, Philippines, and she says that she cannot uh, get back um, onto the uh, connection. So we'll see if she um, comes back. We will certainly uh, turn to her. But next, we will do a special focus on uh, Cambodia because the um, conference that we spoke about earlier, the APCR SHR, was supposed to be in uh, Cambodia not that uh, long ago. But of course, uh, thanks to the uh, pandemic, it had to be cancelled. And it's now uh, turned into this uh, virtual online series. So we thought let's do a special segment on um, Cambodia and specifically the young people of uh, Cambodia who have been extremely outspoken in a conservative context, which we found extremely uh, sort of, uh, you know, a quite um, interesting, quite inspiring. So we have two speakers. We will first start with a YouTube uh, video of someone who calls herself Green Lady Cambodia, and she has a very powerful uh, message to girls and women, which is embrace your unique female body. Can we have the uh, video, please? Thank you. The washboard pad, they think it's nasty, they think it's gross, just something you don't want to see. But it actually, it's like a revolution. So my name is Hope So One with I. I live in Cambodia. I have a business. It's called Green Lady Cambodia. We sell washboard pads and menstrual cups. Plus, it's and pad. It's sticky and sweaty. And we don't have much choice. Let's turn to washboard pad. It's made from cotton and the pool fabric, which they use for baby diaper. So women feel confident because it's not going to leak. Also, we have sewing classes to the rural girls in school. The women in the countryside, um, their level of education is not uh, that high. And also in the classroom, teachers are also shy to talk about just women and men body. We just guide the girls to sew the washboard pad by herself. And then we will go on to how their body look like, the shape and everything. Uh, when will they get their period and how to manage the hygiene and talking about what is hymen and virginity really.
first step, I will go to the shop to buy the cotton, natural cotton from Cambodia. And the money will go to the women who actually grow the cotton. I will take the leak proof and the cotton to the serving lady. Some of them are housewives and some of them are women living with HIV. They generate the income for herself and the family, for the kids to go to school, for them to survive and live by. If you want to use the washboard pad, you have to be really committed. You have to be like, okay, I have to see my blood, I have to wash it, I have to hang it. You soak it and it gets soft, and then you leave it for a night, and then you can wash it in the morning. I feel good whenever I use the cloth pad because I every month it, it reminds me that uh, I menstruate without like um, polluting the environment. We care, huh? we copy some light, some light, and the young power, we love more, love more. I don't need to spend money on buying new pads. I don't need to spend money on buying new pads. I don't need to spend money on buying new pads. It's a change that women will take. They have to embrace the change in themselves. And that's where they empower themselves to do something for themselves. Women's body, like the shape and everything, is unique to you. You own it. Your blood, it's yours, and you own it as well. A feminine power that belongs to you, not anybody else, but you. Thank you so much for that fantastic uh, video. And now from that actually flowing to our next uh, special speaker, as you saw the um, uh, topics of a uh, woman's cycle, uh, menstruation, that all actually feeds into sexual and reproductive health and rights. And for many women and girls, even now in Cambodia and in so many parts of the um, world, I would say such information is not always shared, especially at the time when they need it the uh, very most. So our uh, next uh, speaker is someone from Cambodia who has really been pushing the envelope through her uh, fantastically uh, popular shows on the internet, uh, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook. And so we are extremely proud to uh, present uh, Catherine Harry whose show is called A Dose of Cat, and she has prepared this specially for us. Can we hear it, please? Thank you. Hi, my name is Catherine Harry. I am a writer and a vlogger at A Dose of Cath in Cambodia. My vlog focuses on feminism, on cultural critiques from a gender perspective, as well as sexual and reproductive health. I have been working on sexual and reproductive health for eight years now. Providing young people with comprehensive sexuality education is very important. Growing up, there weren't many places where I could access comprehensive sexuality education. Aside from sneaking off to read articles in magazines, Magazines, which may or may not be factually correct and searching on the internet I had very little choice when I had my first period my mother simply told me that I was an avid reader so I must know what to do and what was happening with my body so she basically left me to it by myself but not every young woman has access to the information that I got and for many many young women when they have the first period they are terrified none of their family members or friends have talked to them about it. Some young girls actually told me that they thought they were going to die. This is why we need comprehensive sexuality education so that young people know how to take care of their bodies and how to protect themselves. When I was young, I received very little sexuality education from school. It was something that the teachers assumed that we would naturally know, which is terribly inaccurate. While parents thought it was something that we shouldn't know. 
Because of this, many young people turn to pornography to get information on sexuality. Not only does pornography not provide an accurate depiction of what sex is, but it also perpetuates harmful stereotypes and brushes over very important issues such as consent. Pornography also rarely shows you how to protect yourself from STIs or unwanted pregnancy. Because of the work that I do, I get so many young people messaging me on a daily basis. Some of the questions that they have asked me have baffled me greatly. The questions that they ask shows a lack of understanding on reproductive and sexual health that is very prevalent in Cambodia. Questions from the usefulness of condoms, whether you can get pregnant from oral sex, or various ways that you can contract STIs. I also get many terrified messages from young people fearing that they might have contracted STIs because of unprotected sex. Had we as a society talked to young people more about sexuality education and equip them with the knowledge, questions like this would never have been asked. It was estimated by UNFPA in 2014 that the pregnancy rate of young girls aged 15 to 19 is 12%. That is a lot of young girls who have to put their lives on hold to care for a child that they might not be financially, emotionally, or physically ready for. We know that women have great potential, but they cannot harness their full potential and maximize their capacity if they have to put their hopes and dreams on hold to start a family that they're not ready for. When I was young, I went through trials and errors when it came to coming to terms with my body, how to take care of my body, how to protect myself, and how to empower myself when it comes to reproductive issues. I was fortunate enough to have a career in a field that allows me to talk to experts and people who know far more than me. Despite all of that, I made some errors of judgment along the way. I wish there was someone to provide me with more information on reproductive and sexual health issues. I wish schools would have equipped me with the knowledge necessary for me to make informed decisions on my sexual journey. This is why I created A Dose of Kath. I wanted to be that person for my generation and the generations that come after. Trials and error are a part of venturing into adulthood, and we're all bound to make mistakes or make choices that we might regret later on in life. But if young people have enough information in hand, then it reduces the chances of them making decisions that might irreversibly alter the course of their lives. Accurate and comprehensive information on sexuality is hard to come by, especially in our language, Khmer. The ones that we have tend to be very academic, and it puts off many young people. I want to bridge that gap. Feminists have fought for the rights for all of us to learn about our bodies, to explore our sexuality, to make decisions over our body autonomy, and to not be ashamed. We need to exercise those rights. I'm a firm believer in choices. Earlier this year, we've seen how the world has spun out of its axis when COVID-19 hit. The world and how everything worked pre-COVID-19 is not the same as the world after. We need to be ready for that. We have seen the importance of the internet when it comes to providing information and education. Classrooms have turned into online classrooms. That means that people are spending more time than ever on the internet. And of course, the internet has everything. There are the good sides and then there are the dark sides. Because of this, I believe that we need to amp up our effort in providing comprehensive sexuality education and promoting choices so that if they happen to go to the dark sides, they can judge for themselves. But we also need to take into account those who are not privileged enough to have access to the internet, such as people in remote areas or people from disadvantaged backgrounds. They need information too, and on-ground activities have halted because of social distancing. I would like to link this to equality, specifically internet equality. When people don't have access to the internet, they lose access to a vast vault of information, and those people tend to be women. If a household only has one phone that can access the internet, the phone tends to go to a male in the family. This is an issue that feminists are looking at, and we're trying to find a way to create an internet space that is accessible to everyone. If people, especially women, are not aware that we have rights and choices, then we cannot make those choices. The world post-COVID-19 is a new world that we're all learning to navigate. Most of us don't have the answers as to how we're gonna go about doing that. 
that. But that's okay. We are all learning together. This is an opportunity for us to turn the world into a better and more equal place. COVID-19 has opened our eyes to the many problems that we previously have turned a blind eye on. It's up to us and our collective effort to decide what changes we want to see. It's scary because it's the unknown. But I believe that when we put our heads together and take into consideration the rights and well-being of everyone, then we can create a world where everyone can exercise their freedom, their rights, and make decisions and choices over every aspect of their lives, including their sexual and reproductive journey. Thank you so much for that, um, Catherine. And now we actually have Catherine with us live from uh, Cambodia. And I would like to ask a very quick follow-up to your uh, fantastic talk. You speak extremely frankly, and Cambodia is still a very conservative um, uh, country. Do you get any backlash on what you say and what you do? Over to you. Uh, thank you, Roy, for the question. I actually, um, navigating through backlash is a daily part of what I'm doing because I'm a woman, I'm a young woman in a conservative country talking about sexuality. I do get a lot of hate. I get a lot of harassment. I have so many people um, accusing me of ruining my own culture because Cambodian women are supposedly supposed to be submissive, um, gentle, shy, we're not supposed to talk about this. So people have accused me of so many things. People have slut shamed me. People have sexually harassed me online, um, in my inbox, on the comments. They have said basically everything under the sun um, about me. I have had a few, I have received a rape threat and I have seen a comment from a man saying that if I was his sister, he would have beaten me up. So things like that, that are very violent and it shows the, it shows what's wrong with society right now when it comes to um, things like gender equality, how women, the internet is not a very safe space for women and for women like me, it's even a more dangerous place. Thank you for uh, sharing that and please stay safe and please uh, carry on this absolutely fantastic and uh, so uh, very important work. Um, now we turn to a, a special speaker from China um, who has really defied the odds. His life is a strong example of not saying, uh, you know, I mean, not taking no for an answer. So we turn to uh, activist uh, Tai Tsong, who is legally uh, blind, and uh, he has journeyed through the challenge to become a genuine pioneer for the rights and choices of uh, people who have uh, physical uh, challenges. And I will turn to him now so he can share with us this most uh, fantastic um, story. Over to you, uh, Tai Tsong. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. This is Cai Tong from China, from One Plus One Network of Disability. Uh, yeah, which is uh, a grassroots umbrella DPOs in China. Uh, I'm so excited that uh, I can share our experiences and the stories here, uh, because uh, you see, according to the World uh, World Report on Disability, uh, ten years ago. Uh, the world population of disability has reached more than 1 billion uh, in the world, but always the, per the rights and the needs of PWDs uh, have always been left behind. Um, so today I will share you very sh uh, four very short stories of my life and to show uh, the situation of SHR of persons with disability in China may be uh, the same as uh, the situation in all over of the world. Uh, my eyesight uh, was broken uh, when uh, when I was 10 years old, maybe 24 years ago. So at that time, uh, we, my family don't have uh, information, don't have any information about disability, how to 
how to live with a disability and uh, also we don't have any information that uh, which school I can go. So at that time, uh, I went to the regular school uh, without any support to study there. Uh, as far as I record that uh, the most, uh, the, 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 only, the only thing uh, which is related to the SRHR is now our biology. Uh, we have uh, na- th- that there is a chapter uh, which name is reproductive uh, reproductive system, uh, but uh, when we go to that that uh, that chapter uh, that chapter, our teacher said, "Oh, you can learn learn it by yourself." Uh, at that time, I was so uh, embarrassed because uh, all of my other classmates can read the books and uh, can see the pictures, um, but I couldn't. And I am so ashamed that I'm so shy uh, to ask others to help me. So that, that's the first time uh, I have something to do with the SRHR of persons with disabilities. So later, I studied in a regular school uh, until uh, I graduated from the high school uh, in 2005. At that time, we don't have policies to provide a reasonable accommodation for the persons with disability to participate in the entrance examination to the university. So I have go to the special college for the blind and have no choice. I can only to I can only study the major of acupuncture and massage. Uh, um, but uh, at that time, in our opinion, uh, for blind people who can go to the university is a brilliant thing. So we don't, uh, we, we have no idea about that. I, I want to have choice uh, in my major. So I went to, went to the college. Uh, in the first semester, we have uh, a subject which name is uh, anatomy. So we were, we were so excited because uh, Nari is also a, uh, a chapter which is the reproductive uh, system. Uh, before we go to the chapter, before the night, the night before we go to the chapter, uh, we talked a lot uh, during midnight in our apartment. Uh, we asked, we were so excited, but when we go to the classroom the next day, our teachers said the same things I met uh, 10 years ago. Uh, she said that, oh, uh, you can learn it by yourself because it's necessary for you in the future. You, you are going to be a massager and you are blind. At that time, we were, we were shocked and surprised because we think we are a university student of medicine, but the teacher said the reproductive system is not necessary for us. So that's given me another another thinking about the situation of persons with disability on the SIHR. So that's the two stories uh, about myself. Another two is about my family. The first one is my wife. She is also blind and uh, she she studied a massage in the the school for the blind and uh, after that she ran a a massage clinic. Uh, But uh, as a woman with a disability, she faced a very um, hard problems for her. That is the uh, sexual harassment. So um, she hated the sexual harassment a lot, and uh, she had no idea to deal with it. So every day, uh, you see, uh, the the guests who want to do massage always go to the clinic after 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 work. So uh, they always go there, uh, maybe uh, in the evening or in the night. Uh, but uh, the 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 sexual the sexual harassment always happens also in the midnight. So uh, she, mm, so she every day she closed the, the clinic uh, at seven o'clock uh, at seven o'clock uh, p.m. So the, the business of her clinic was so bad uh, not not for a long time. Uh, she, she was bankrupt. And after that, she wanted to go out to do something to do something for uh, for new. Because, uh, but her family, her parents said that 
uh, you are a uh, blind and uh, you are a girl, uh, the best situation, the best choice for you is that uh, stay at home and we can find a boy uh, who married with you and uh, he he will look up he will look after you in the future uh, but she but she said that's that was not my dream and uh, she fight with her parents and uh, go out uh, and he and she went to Beijing and we know we knew each other later we get married after that uh, we want to have a baby but uh, when when she was Pregnant, we go to the uh, hospital to have the obstetric uh, examination, and the, the doctor said that oh, I I think I thought you should go to have a gene examination to make sure that you won't uh, have a baby who who will be also blind because you shouldn't have you couldn't continue your tragedy of your life. Uh, this, this, mm, I, I, I think the, those situations we met in our life mm, reflect the at, the attitudes of the public, of the experts, of the stakeholders. Uh, all the persons with disability always live under the charity, the traditional, under the medical model, not the human rights model. Mm, because we met so many life experiences and we met so many problems and difficulties. Uh, after that, uh, when I go to work um, in our organization, One Plus One, uh, we take the SRHR as a very important uh, topic in our network. So uh, in our work is very, maybe is very complicated. So I can just uh, talk a little about it. Uh, in our work about the SRHR of persons with disability, we have three aspects. The first one is enlightening and empower the persons with disabilities to let them know that we have rights to SRHR and others should, others should respect our dignity and our needs. And the second aspect is to raising the awareness of the stakeholders especially the doctors, the teachers, and the policymakers and the researchers. Of course, we cooperated with them uh, to improve some right-based services. And the last one, last, last aspect is the public education. Uh, we Every year we will hold many different uh, public advocacy campaigns uh, such as we will ask many persons with disability to give public speech uh, to the the public on the uh, on the through internet or in the theater to share the stories like I shared uh, be, um, previously and uh, to show different types of persons with disabilities we have different types of needs and have the same rights with others. Uh, Mm, because of the time, so I uh, will uh, finish my sh sharings here. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you so much, uh, Tsai Song. Um, uh, we actually have uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Junis back with us, but I would like to ask you, Tsai Song, a very quick yeah? uh, question about uh, what is the situation for people with uh, physical challenges during this COVID-19 time? You were sharing okay. with folks that there were some challenges. Could you very quickly share those with us? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, okay. During the, um, the outbreaking of COVID-19, uh, we initiated a um, cross-sectional survey and uh, research uh, about the, um, the, 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 the difficulties facing by persons with disabilities. So we think uh, the most... Uh, important thing is the digital gap for all we can see the uh, information accessibility uh, because uh, not, not, not only for the uh, the prevention prevention and the uh, healthcare service uh, about the covid-19 and but also uh, during the outbreaking uh, we 
the the students uh, who have to study through the internet. Uh, so um, we uh, we need we uh, spread a, a questionnaire through the internet. Uh, more than two thousand uh, more than two thousand persons with disabilities and their uh, parents uh, answer our questionnaire to show that. Uh, 20% of the persons with disabilities have uh, no way, no, no, have, have no channels to get the, uh, get enough information uh, accessibly uh, about the, the prevention and the healthcare, healthcare uh, inf service information about COVID-19. Yeah, and uh, most of the students uh, who are blind and deaf uh, was excluded uh, from the, the 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 study through the internet. Yeah, that's the. I think that's the most um, difficulties uh, we are facing through the COVID nineteen for the persons with disabilities. Thank you so much for uh, sharing this, and I'm so happy that we had you with us because these are stories that we don't normally hear, even those of us who actually work in these uh, fields don't, um, don't have access to these stories. We should really make ourselves much more proactive with the kind of work that you and your uh, colleagues do. So thank you so much for uh, sharing this. So now yeah. the talks with Dr. Junis, who is back with us after the thunderstorm, uh, I think uh, knocked you off for a, a short uh, time. Dr. Um, Junis uh, Melgar is in the Philippines. She is extremely uh, well known over the years for her absolute fearless advocacy for sexual and reproductive uh, health and rights. And she is in charge of the uh, Khan Center for uh, Women's Health. Dr. Um, Junis, um, over to you. Um, I know you have a fantastic uh, story to share. Thank you. I was going to forego this presentation. Uh, do you still want me to go through with it, Roy? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely, okay. we have time because this is such a strong uh, presentation. Please, go ahead. Okay. Uh, getting sexual and reproductive health clinics to open in the Philippines, especially during the extreme lockdown of March to May, was extremely difficult. Um, even... Uh, those of us who provide services, uh, we had to secure permits from the many layers of bureaucracy, from the tiniest to the highest. We had to get permits to open our eight clinics on sexual and reproductive health. But we were not the only ones having difficulty. Actually, uh, my story is about the women who had experienced the, mo the most, more and most severe hardships to get the services they needed and the services that actually required uh, for them to survive. The Khan's own patients in our clinics had to walk two to three kilometers to get to the clinics because there are no transport. They would wait further for, for, for minutes in queues in observance of social distancing before they could get methods like the implant or the injectable that they could not get uh, in their uh, neighborhood drug stores. But finding a place where they could deliver was a bigger challenge to pregnant women, as many of them found the smaller birthing centers closed and the larger hospitals refusing to admit them because they could have COVID. One patient we know was shunted through eight hospitals before getting admitted to a hospital several cities away from where she lived. In late April, media documented the tragic death of a young mother who bled to death from a retained placenta because none of the six hospitals that they went to would admit her. In the case of women who came to us complaining of partner violence, and we had an increase of this in our facilities, there were no shelters available, no transport vehicle to take them to the safety of their family, back to their families or friends. So women were left with no choice but to stay with abusers, they said, until the COVID storm passed. 
As government efforts are fixed on the COVID response, the Reproductive Health Advocacy Network, the National Network of Grassroots Women, Health Providers, and Advocates, born of 14 years of struggle to enact the Philippines Reproductive Health Law, is trying to fill in the gaps. So Likhaan and other NGO clinics are back to regular operations, five days a week, seven to eight hours a day, some providing transport for patients. These clinics are now augmented by virtual consultation and counseling platforms, including a chatbot for young people. For those who do not know chatbot, it's an artificial intelligence uh, app programmed to respond to common queries on SRH for young people in Filipino and English. Likhaan and SRH colleagues also join video conferences, which are almost like weekly now, on policies with the Department of Health, PhilHealth, Philippine Health Insurance, Population Development Commission, UNFPA, USAID, and others to talk about the Department of Health's interim family planning and MCH policies to ensure contraceptive supplies, uh, financing and budgets for 2021, integrating GBV into SRH programs, and many more. So we know that there's a whole slew of important policy decisions that are happily ongoing. Likhan is also part of the lively web discussion among women and SRH groups on the intersectionality of SRHR and general political issues like government social amelioration program for the poor, for the workers, now during COVID, food security, now during COVID, migration with, uh, with OFWs coming home, climate change, political repression, which is happening in the country, and many other, what, what we would call the social determinants of sexual and reproductive health and rights. So even as COVID-19 rages in the Philippines today, one of the few countries where COVID is rising, SRHR activists are helping to stave off the further erosion of essential health care and to build health sector resistant, uh, resilience, not resistance, through sustained policy making, service provision, and intersectoral partnerships. Activists are also helping to build social solidarity on the COVID front by helping in public education and advocating for the rights of patients against discrimination, but also the rights of providers to be protected. As activists and based on our experience with the reproductive health law, we believe that empowered individuals and communities are key to overcome overcoming COVID-19, just as empowered individuals and communities are the key to fully achieving sexual and reproductive health and rights. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, uh, Junis, for that. Um, I know we are running over time, but this is so fascinating. I mean, these uh, speakers have been so fantastic. Um, if I can ask you a quick follow-up, Dr. Uh, uh, Junis, um, You've been fighting for the RH law for so long, and you're still fighting on so many fronts. Um, what is your impression of where things are heading and, you know, where you've been coming from and where you see yourself going? Um, I think I, 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 I find a reflection of myself, actually, in Catherine. Uh, Catherine was called a slut. In my case, <laughs> I was called an abortionist, a child killer, to my face, on radio, TV, on the mass media, uh, a senator in the Philippines who's now the Senate president, actually called me also as an abortionist, as actually trying to sabotage the reproductive health law by inserting in abortion. So, so you get all those names that are actually very hurtful and threatening in the Philippines where abortion is totally illegal. Um, but I get courage, uh, like Catherine, from, from family, 
from the Coven of Witches. <laughs> Sexual and reproductive health rights activists are called witches. <laughs> and we have a coven, and it's a growing coven, fortunately. And I think the best defense are the communities. The communities that we serve actually accept what we do, and actually because they know those are real problems in the community. So um, we know that there will always be challenges. There, there will always be challenges from conservative forces in very, very Catholic Philippines. And those challenges continue. But I think so long as we have a movement behind us, I think that's, that's where we draw our strength. And I think that's why it's very important to grow, to grow that movement, to make sure that even after us, our young daughters, our young uh, sons, my, my only son, will grow up to be advocates and activists for sexual and reproductive health and rights. Thank you so much. Now, in closing, I would like to turn again to Gita and to Bjorn. I know you've been both um, uh, hearing all of these speak, uh, uh, speakers, um, you know, with uh, huge attention. Gita, first to you for your quick impressions on what you've heard, and then Bjorn, over to you after that. Gita. Thanks. <coughs> Thanks very much, uh, Roy. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, I just want to say what a fabulous webinar. I'm so delighted that I agreed to join you for this. Um, um, you know, UN agencies can sometimes be a little stodgy, but you have been anything but stodgy in this. Thank you. Speak webinar. a little bit closer, Gita. Yeah, you've been anything but stodgy in this webinar. Um, the speakers have been terrific. The um, video footage, the approach, I'm so thrilled that I've met uh, people like Catherine, Harry, and Tsai Tsong uh, for the first time here, uh, and I hope to be in touch with them again. I think the things that they said uh, were of great importance and point to something that in the middle of backlash and pandemics and difficulties and so on, we know that the spirit of young people, of people who are oppressed in so many different ways, lives on and is, go and is going nowhere except towards success. So great success to all of you. And of course, to my old good friend, Junis Melgar, uh, the longtime fighter from the Philippines for gender equality, um, and human rights, um, including sexual and reproductive rights. Thank you. Thank you, Gita. And now, finally, but not least, over to you, Bjorn. Thank you so much, Roy. And, and let me start to thank all the panelists. I, I really uh, feel energized and encouraged to listen to your stories. Uh, and I think working in the area of population development, sexual and reproductive health and rights, it really comes from your heart. It, it re that's really where it starts, and your passion and your conviction that things can change. And, um, you know, ever since I've been involved in this area of field, you know, I've always I've tried to leave, but I've always boomeranged back. It, it's, you can't really, how can you not be engaged in this area when it really touches you as an individual, uh, regardless of age and, and regardless of sex. And I think we all have uh, stories to tell. And, and of course, that's the challenge and the sensitivities around what we have been talking about today, that it challenges the norms and values. And I, in, my, in my own um, thinking around what's happening in Asia and the Pacific is ex actually this. You can see a very rapid economic development, changes, urbanization, trends, at least before COVID. But, but, you know, things are moving quickly. It's a very vibrant region. But norms and values, unfortunately, in many areas, especially in rural areas, are stagnant. 
and these norms and values are still setting the uh, the um, uh, the frame, if you like, for how men and people, uh, how uh, women, women and men, should interact and 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 uh, you know be. So we need to challenge these norms and values, but we need, to, of course, to do it with the greatest respect and understanding that also these you know changes takes it takes it changes take take time and they need to come from within but at the same time working at the more national level to change the legal framework so that we really can achieve uh, universal access to sexual and reproductive health so with this roy i really you know feel very encouraged and it's so good to see see you all you know Eunice and gita again and very nice to meet Catherine and, and Chang and, and uh, you know, uh, to give us this injection in these days where we really need it. So thank you, everybody, for uh, a fantastic conversation. Over to you, Roy. Thank you so much, Bjorn, and thank you to all our speakers once again and to the audience. Uh, we saw many questions from our uh, uh, friends in the uh, media. Some of them were actually answered in the uh, course of the conversation. Others haven't been, but I have put my email address in the Zoom chat box, so please contact me, and I will then connect you with our speakers for sure. And a very quick final uh, programming note from the APCRSHR um, colleagues. They say that their next uh, session in the APCRSHR 10 virtual online series will be on the 20th of this month with a focus on sexual and reproductive health and rights in the Pacific. And of course, you can get all that um, information at the APCR SHR uh, website, and I'm sure they will be in touch with you. So with that, thank you all, uh, you know, uh, wherever you are, uh, Bangkok, Asia Pacific, the other uh, parts of the um, world, I see that we have several uh, people in the audience uh, today, and that was absolutely fantastic to see. So from all of us, thank you, take care, stay safe, and uh, keep in touch. Bye for now.